Good evening and a very warm welcome to the Oxford Martin School. I'm Ian Golden, the director, and it's a huge pleasure to welcome you to our Women's Day event. Uh, as many of you might know, Women's Day is actually on Monday the 8th, but uh, we're always in the future. So uh, uh, we're proud uh, to be able to do it on a day that uh, was convenient to Judy and really delighted uh, that she's agreed to give this lecture, um, Judy Wiseman, uh, because we believe she has so much to contribute and has contributed so much to our understanding of uh, technology, work, uh, the place of gender in it, uh, and in much broader social sciences issues around this. This is the third uh, in our annual series of Women's Day lectures. Last year, you might recall, we had Dame Sally Davis, the chief medical officer of the UK, uh, and the year before, we had uh, Baroness Helena Kennedy uh, speaking. So uh, this is a tradition that uh, we are absolutely delighted to uphold. Of course, it's a tradition that's uh, been going over 106 years, the first International Women's Day uh, in 1910, uh, started by the Socialist International um, in Copenhagen, but since then, something which has got much wider traction and which is uh, thankfully also leading to very, very significant progress uh, in gender equity and the broader questions uh, associated with it. And no doubt Judy will uh, tell us some of that, some of the things that have been achieved, but also of the massive distance that still needs to be traveled uh, in this area. Professor Judy Wiseman is currently visiting professor at the Oxford Internet Institute. We've been very fortunate in Oxford uh, that she's spending a sabbatical period up here. Uh, but when she's not up here, she's the Anthony Giddens Professor of Sociology at the London School of Economics. Uh, she previously was Professor of Sociology uh, at the Australian National University, and if you look at her CV, you'll see that uh, there are very, very many universities that have benefited uh, from her being there. She's one of the founding contributors to the field of social study of s uh, science and technology, uh, and a topic which is now regarded as uh, absolutely normal and current, uh, which is the intersection of society and sci uh, science technology uh, and society is one that she really was pioneering in it, uh, writing a number of books in this area. The Social Shaping of Technology, Feminism Confronts Technology, and Managing Like a Man are all regarded as classics uh, in the field. And her latest book, Pressed for Time, uh, is also rapidly graining wide acclaim. She's been the president of the Society of Social Studies of Science. She's been the recipient of no numerous awards and just recently been given a doctor honorary causa from the University of Geneva. It's a huge pleasure to have you here and to welcome you to the stage. Thank you very much, Ian, for that very warm and generous introduction. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure today and, a, and an honor, actually, to be giving this lecture for International Women's Day. And I'm taking this opportunity to tell you a bit about my book. And that's very easy to do because these topics combine very well. Because in my view, the way we think about science and technology, about what counts as skill and expertise, and even how we think about time, is heavily influenced by gender relations. You might wonder why the Martin Institute is honoring this day. Surely we've entered a digital age, the second machine age, the fourth industrial revolution, and so on and so on. Surely whatever you call this high-tech future, something as old hat as women's equality will no longer be an issue. In fact, some people have said to me, even marking International Women's Day is a bit passe. So I feel bound to just remind you uh, very quickly, and this audience probably doesn't need reminding, of how few women there are leading large companies, how few women CEOs there are still. I gather that there are more CEOs in Britain named John than there are women. And the latest World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report says it will take another 118 years for women to be earning the same as men. 
And more to the point for this lecture, I must highlight how few women there are in computing, engineering and technology. Only 6%, yes, 6% of working engineers in Britain are women, which I think is absolutely scandalous. And of the um, students studying computing and engineering in Britain, and Oxford is typical of this, the number of the women are around 13%. And it's, it's disappointing because we have now had decades and decades of initiatives to get more women into STEM subjects, into science, technology, engineering and maths. And if anything, the figures have been declining. This same Future of Jobs report, like all of the reports, talks about the fact, I mean, all these reports about where future employment is going to be, like the wonderful reports that are that done right here at the Martin Institute, all say that there's going to be job loss, but where there's going to be jobs is actually in the STEM professions. Um, so this really is something urgent, the issue about women in STEM. Britain has got a very a great shortage of these skills, and women are the obvious untapped pool. So while correcting this is crucial, my point today is broader, but I wanted to start by making that point centre center, um, on that point. My point today is that, that this gender divide actually shapes how we think about technology and limits our capacity to imagine what alternative futures might look like. In other words, I want to argue that the way we think about technology, work and time are all to varying degrees blinkered by this imbalance by unequal opportunity, and even by old-fashioned stereotypes. I mean, this is the first Lego toy um, of a woman scientist, which came out just a couple of years ago. I read in the paper today that Lego is still the greatest toy manufacturer uh, in the world, and I showed this to somebody, and they said, but surely she's making perfume. Not sure if that's right. Um, but I think it's sort of telling how recently um, even Lego have been making models um, you know, these models of women scientists. Now, like many of you, I suspect, I watched some of the Davos debates and heard Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook's pithy comment that men still run the world and it's not going that well. So I thought I would add men are still in charge of science and technology and it's not going that well. So let me explain. I'm a sociologist by background and I'm proud to be one of the founders of what is known as the Social Studies of Science and Technology. This field has for many years challenged the mainstream view of technologies as neutral, value-free tools that emerge independently of society. And few academics now would subscribe to what's known as a hard technological determinism, the view that technologies on their own somehow drive social changes. The recognition that technological change is profoundly shaped by social, economic and political circumstances is now well established, at least in theory. However, what's less understood in much of the literature is that artefacts are socially shaped not only in their usage, but also in their design and technical content. When I say that all technologies are social, what I mean is that they're crystallizations of society they bear the imprint of the people and the social context from which they emerge. So I always argue that technologies reflect and express our times as much as shape them. And so for me, it's simply logical that if artefacts are social and have politics, and if we live in a society characterised by gender hierarchy, then this is likely to be reflected in the kinds of technologies we choose to develop and invest in. This matters hugely not only for the here and now, but also because the very way in which ima we imagine our future is with and through these same tools and techniques. Consider how often speculations about forthcoming innovations are described as finally making science fiction come true. It's as if we can't even begin to think about the future, possible futures, without thinking about it primarily in technological terms. And this brings me to our current obsession with robots. I wrote a couple of books years ago, as you can see, years ago, and what one might think, looking back, that I was incre incredibly prescient in 1991 in putting Maria from Metropolis, there she is, on the front cover. Or was I? 
Or is this fixation about the agency of robots age old? And in which case, why is it in full ascendancy right now? It's true that as early as ancient Greece, we've been dreaming of robots, and these robots have generally taken one of two forms. On the one hand, there's the mindless mechanical slave that relieves their masters of toil, and on the other, there's the more complex humanoid machine that, as almost a mirror to ourselves, possesses consciousness. This dichotomy has persisted from the writings of Homer, and I think it persists all the way through to the narratives of science fiction today. Indeed, I think these ideas have remained remarkably um, stable till today. When viewing the contemporary science fiction films, Her and Ex Machina, I was reminded of the classical myth, Greek myth of Pandora, the first human woman created by the gods. She's endowed with many gifts, including mind, speech, and strength, but is also seductively devious, ultimately opening the jar from which all evil comes. And in the Hollywood films, meanwhile, the female androids cunningly manipulate and outsmart the innocent male protagonists who fall in love with them. The film Her is particularly clever, as the personal assistant only exists as a voice on the smartphone, and still Theodore falls in love with her. When he does want more than phone sex, it all gets a bit uh, tricky. But what I want to say is that I think for all the futuristic, <coughs> scientific sophistication in these films, the films sim simply would not work if the genders uh, re were reversed. That is, if the personal assistant had a male voice rather than Scarlett Johansson's. So what does our contemporary fascination with humanoid machines tell us about our culture and the way it envisages the relationship between humans and non-humans. For the remainder of my talk this evening, I want to explore the ways in which robotics and automation more generally embodied the desire to save valuable time, to delegate labor, and thus free us for life's important things. The future envisaged by the evangelists of Silicon Valley of a world replete with sociable robots is hyped as radical change. Robots promise to fulfill roles that are currently performed by people, that is, to serve in today's service economy. But I'm going to argue that this vision may turn out not to be as radical as they claim. And I think it's revealing, if not, un if not surprising, that these machines are configured to resemble stereotypical human-like, often female, bodies. But first, let me elaborate on the relationship between technology and time, the subject of my book. Not so long ago in the 1980s, when we were having the microelectronic revolution, which I remember very well, we talked about the fact that we were moving into a post-industrial leisure society. We talked about how we'd have to put on courses to teach people how to deal with their excess leisure. This isn't very long ago. But now we're in a digital age, and instead of being, time being abundant, we all now share the experience of time poverty. The iconic image that abounds, and it's here every week uh, in the newspapers, is that of the harassed citizen, head down on the screen, always rushing. Machines were supposed to make our lives easier, yet we hear constant laments that we're pressed for time and that the pace of everyday life is accelerating. We have more technology than ever before, and yet everyone complains about how busy they are. And not only is the pace of life accelerating, but we're constantly told that the rate of technological innovation is itself accelerating, and that these two things are causally linked. And so it leaves us endlessly vacillating between regarding digital devices as the cause of time pressure and turning to them as the solution. Let me just try and unpack this paradox. Now, if we believe the cyber gurus of Silicon Valley, this speed will make our lives better by making us more efficient, allowing us to do many things at once, faster, simultaneously. The digital devices are all sold to us as time-saving tools that will promote an action-packed life. And there's now a technological fix for absolutely everything endless apps for better time management that promise to free up time. There's iWatches, there's self-logging wristbands, um, 
There are even these geeks in California who've now designed liquid food, because uh, time is so precious, liquid food to save time. And I think about this self-driving car as very much part of this promise about how to maximise time. Now, acceleration isn't just a lifestyle uh, trend, and just quickly for the social scientists who are, who are here, um, acceleration and speed are also the buzzword of social theorists. There's a whole load of social theorists, all of whom are arguing that digitalization has accelerated time and spawned a new temporality. And this is variously described. As you can see, social theorists always have their, their own um, conceptual framework, whether it's timeless time, instantaneous time, network time. Uh, Castells is quoted a lot, and he very much talks about in the network society about the death of sort of the clock time, you know, the linear clock time of the industrial age, and we're in this new epoch in which time disappears. Now, there's lots of differences between these social theorists, and I do talk about that at length in my book, but the reason that I've got them up here. Um, is that I just want to make the point that they all share this idea that speed is the quintessential experience of modernity. You know, it's one of the defining characteristics of our contemporary times. The driving force is technology, and it's socially destructive. And I think they all share um, this kind of line. And they're all, they all kind of um, make for a cautionary tale, really, um, about speed. And it has an uncanny resemblance to a lot of the more popular literature that is coming out every day. I used to buy every one of these books, and I've stopped now because they're coming out so often. But every week, you can buy a book about um, the current state of busyness and distraction. And there's loads of advice on how to deal with digital addiction. Um, Just the Guardian at the weekend, their magazine had the big picture of overwhelmed. Um, Oliver Berkman, as usual, with 10 tips how to deal with being overwhelmed, right? It's just sort of everywhere. Uh, and the solution um, is some form of digital detox. You know, go off the grid, lock up the machines, and return to a more authentic natural state. And of course, uh, you know, in California, there is now an organization called Digital Detox. Of course, it runs holiday weekend camps where um, you can you check in, you put your stuff in the box, you check in for the weekend um, with your stuff. And the tagline I love, and actually I found various of these different organisations, and all of them have got the same tagline, which is fantastic, I think, disconnect to reconnect. I mean, one of them I was looking at, of course, at the bottom, it said, do fill in your email so we can keep in touch with you. You know, <laughs> I thought, no, nah, I'm not doing that, you know. Um, and I sort of can't help wondering if after the weekend, all these people on a Monday morning get back on Facebook and boast to their friends about how they lasted a whole weekend off the grid, you know. So the first thing I want to say about much of this writing um, is that I think the way in which it describes the relationship between technology and speed is still implicitly technologically determinist. Every academic nowadays claims not to um, fall into this, but I think it still has a bit of a um, sense of this. It's as if we're hostages to the logic of machines, as if the technology itself is inevitably driving the pace of life. And in my book, in a nutshell, what I try and argue is that the contemporary imperative of speed is as much a cultural artifact as it is a technological one that if we feel rushed and pressed for time, it's because of the priorities and parameters we set ourselves, and not because of the technology per se. In other words, as an STS scholar, as we call ourselves, science and technology studies scholar, I think about technology and time as socio-material practices. And I think that we really understand time with and through machines, and it's we who make sense of um, and give these technologies their meaning. So I think it's a mistake to really uh, think about acceleration as this uniform process dominating all aspects of contemporary life. I think this vision of a sort of single regime of speed only makes sense if you give far too much power to technology itself. And what's actually missing if you, um, from these grand narratives, which are all about emergent new historical epochs, we're always on the brink of a new historical epoch. I have been there many times before, and perhaps we can come back to this in discussion. It seems to me that what this loses sight of, really, is the temporal in terms of live time 
actually live time structured in particular social, economic and political contexts. And too often speed up is discussed as if we all have the same experience of time pressure and as if time is an individual resource rather than a collective accomplishment. And both of these points, thinking about time pressure as something that we all share and thinking about time as an individual resource rather than a collective accomplishment, I think both of these things have real implications for the project of robotics, and so that's what I want to sort of go on to elaborate now. Let's take the example of information overload and email. I've actually done a lot of research as a sociologist of work on how managers and professionals use IT, and I'm very familiar from business schools that I've spent time in as well, uh, like London Business School, about the endless estimates about how much time is wasted uh, doing email. One reads this every day. And I go to conferences where there are geeks, um, it was Norwegian geeks last time, but there are geeks from everywhere, competing to design more and more sophisticated email filter systems. And if only they can get the filter system right, um, they'll have, you know, which is a technical problem, um, they'll have solved uh, the, this problem of email. And a lot of money is also being spent on ever better electronic diaries and schedules. I was at a high-level high conference in uh, Washington recently, and all the execs, I, you know, I was talking about times, so all the execs got out their phones immediately and showed me their electronic diaries. You know, one of the guys was, had actually designed one for Google, and they all said to me, you know, I was actually the only woman at the table, and they all said to me, you've got to understand in Silicon Valley, managing time is the big issue, Jude, the, the big issue. And I can see that, but I'm not sure they've got it quite right. Mm. What I found in my own research is that the fact that we feel we need to respond to email quickly isn't to do with the speed of data transmission. It's not about the frequency of communication. It's about the collective norms that are built up about appropriate response times. Smartphones do extend expectations of perpetual availability, but what I found is that people at different levels of the organisation respond rather differently, and that over time, custom and practice uh, kicks in, and there are various practices that people establish about when it's appropriate to text or phone and go and uh, see people. But of course, all of these things are predicated on power relations. An individual's ability to resist the pressure of perpetual availability very much depends on the institutional context. Compare, for example, the policies of Volkswagen and Daimler in Germany, where they have had policies to ban emails at the weekend and in evenings. Forgive me for those of you who know this story, but everyone loves the story about the Daimler um, email that was sent uh, while people were on vacation that said, uh, the person you have emailed is on vacation. Your email has actually been deleted. Uh, if it's important, email uh, when the person returns. Now compare this to what you would get if you worked at Google. Like many people, I picked up a copy um, of How Google Works at the airport by Eric Schmidt and jo jo Jonathan uh, Rosenberg. And in this book, for those of you who haven't seen it, there's actually a section called overworked in a good way. Yeah, literally, overworked in a good way. And they say here that work-life balances are insulting to smart employees. They have worked with young mums, moms, who completely go dark for a few hours in the evening and then around nine o'clock, the emails and charts start coming in and we know we have their attention. Now this for me highlights another aspect of how time is collective and not individual. What Google parents are doing here by logging in in the evening is the increasingly difficult task of complex scheduling in order to make quality time for their children. The fact that this is so difficult is not because of technology per se, but because of social changes, such as the rise of dual earner families and, and, a, and an incredible change in norms of parenting, what I sometimes refer to as the intensification of parenting. I mean, what people think good parenting is now is very different than what they thought in the 50s, and it is much more time consuming. And so what people are trying to do is not just make more time any time, but time together and quality time. 
And you only have to ask the unemployed about this. There are studies of the unemployed who have much more time than they want, but actually very much still value the weekends. And that's because at the weekends, their friends and family also have time. And so this is much more precious time. And in sociology, we actually uh, refer to this, try and think about this, as time actually being a network good, meaning that its value depends on your ability to share it with other people. I think in that way, it's rather different than money, um, but I'm sort of still trying to think that through. So time is lived at the intersection of, a, of an array of social differences in which some people's time and labour is much more valuable than other people's and where some groups actually gain speed at the expense of other people. In other words, speed is a discourse rather than a reality for many. Nevertheless, we're all constantly invited to work on our individual time. And having a good relationship with time nowadays is equated to having a good relationship with technology. So does it matter then what sort of technology we have if I've argued that, that speed is a cultural phenomenon? Does it matter about the technology? I think it matters a great deal. That's obviously why I do sociology of technology. And in this final section, I want to consider how our de deeply held belief that the faster we do things, the more we save time is constantly fed by innovations. I can't go into history here, but in my book I describe how the sheer speed of innovation is now equated with inventiveness, productivity and efficiency. It's the ultimate measure of progress. And this instrumental philosophy lies at the heart of engineering, artificial intelligence and robotics, in which the latest, the fastest and the most automated systems are seen as objectively the best. Well, are they? Are the best technical designs always about maximising efficiency in the sense of being economical with time? Now, don't get me wrong. Automating routine physical toil is wonderful. I love my household appliances, especially uh, my washing machine. And so I'm very attracted by the economist Ha Yu Chang's argument in 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism, where he actually has one of the headings of his chapter, how the washing machine changed the world much more than the internet. I mean, actually, I think it's a bit determinist and I've got problems with it, but actually I think it's fantastic that he even sort of poses this question and puts it right up there in his book on economics. But it's the quest for the humanoid intelligent machine that will not only serve us, but will also create the illusion of caring about us that I've got some concerns about. Aside from the possibility of this, its desirability must be questioned. Beginning with, with work in the 50s, artificial intelligence, as you all know, um, has extended the conception of machines from, from this instrumental industrial context to include a discourse of machines as acting and interacting with us. It's extending its scope to, to what is now known as effective com computing, which seeks to endow machines with emotional intelligence. This new generation of robots is being designed to behave as if they have feelings. And here we have Pearl, uh, a nurse bot, for example, who is given basic facial features so that it can take an anthropomorphic form. Sociable robots in the form of Tamagotchi pets are commonplace in Japan. And indeed, Japan is at the forefront of a lot of this automation as it has an aging population. I'd also like to say that it's not just, in, you know, again, the standard sentence is Japan's at the forefront because it has an aging population. The bits that's left out is also because it has strong political resistance to immigration. Yeah, that's a huge bit, but somehow that often gets left off the end uh, because it is, in fact, how these problems have been solved in a lot of countries. Um, and it doesn't quite fit with the automation story, but we can come back to that. Now, what's particularly interesting for me is why scientists persist in designing robots that take the bodily form either of a cute, cuddly animal, always cute, big eyes, you know, a child, often a boy, or an adult, almost always a female. 
And this is despite the fact that there are massive engineering problems of locomotion, perception, cognition, and interaction with them if they take this kind of form. Now, this may seem innocent enough, but I think it's important and should be noted that making machine entities recognisable approximations of natural life species plays a key role in legitimating this whole scientific enterprise. Robot creations are thus routinely given names, like Asimo or Pepper, which function to endow them with a particular individuality and personality in the form of a timeless universal selfhood, a subject without a history. But as my colleague Bernie from the Internet Institute reminded me, these robots may appear to be personal to us as individuals, but their names are actually corporate brands. I thought, yes, of course. So in a sense, these robots do have a history. It's the history of their makers and designers that they carry with them. Now, why we humans are so susceptible to developing feelings of attachment to machines is a more complex matter. And there's loads of studies of children um, and the elderly interacting with robots that imitate living companions. And they do show universally that we seem to form a bond uh, with these machines, with Furbies. And uh, I remember in um, Sherry, one of Sherry Turkle's books, she talks about how even scientists developing the robots um, you know, are worried about leaving them alone in the lab at night because um, they won't be looked after. Um, and it is incredible how we project all of these um, feelings and responses onto robots. We have an extraordinary capacity for doing this, but my point is that the whole project and promise of robots relies on our tendency to anthropomorphise these objects. So the futurists live us have us very happily living in a world in which there's going to be these sociable robots and they're going to be caring and entertaining kids and all of these things. And of course, when you look to Japan, it doesn't seem far-fetched. Here we have Pepper. I thought it was great. It was sort of red and blue, but I'm not going to go there. Um, the manufacturer, um, SoftBank, claims that Pepper can hold conversations, read human emotions, and move autonomously can educate, entertain, and even help with banking and holiday check-ins. You wonder who it's designed for, but anyway, holiday check-ins, OK? The chief executive, Bayoshu Son, described Pepper's launch as, to quote, a baby stage, which I think is interesting because there's this evolutionary metaphor is at the heart of a lot of these um, models, actually. A baby step in our dream to make a robot that can understand a person's feelings and then autonomously take action. We're putting emotion into the robot and giving it a heart. Now, the Japanese promotional material portrays the substitution of robots for babysitting, housework, and elder care as freeing up time to restore sociability. I find this kind of ironic in an age where digital devices are blamed for, you know, for increasing isolation. And it sort of makes me think that actually all this time that we've saved, we might just spend hooked into another screen, into another machine, you know. Um, but seriously, what would it mean in practice for domestic nurse bots to look after the elderly? There are obviously loads of positive potentials. Um, taking people, escorting people walking for exercise or to attend meals is obviously a good thing because it's extremely time consuming. Old people move very slowly. There's lots of ways in which um, telemedicine is being developed in Europe and in the States um, and will save a lot of money and is, and is a very good thing. However, many of the physical tasks that nurse bots can perform simultaneously provide an opportunity for social interaction. When the dead, lifeless labour embodied in machines is substituted for living labour, this opportunity is stripped away. The elderly are reduced to a standard universal model that have uniform needs. And actually, without such standardisation, the robot's program can't function. But caring time encompasses a wide range of activities and involves a complex set of emotions. While it does involve routine physical and logistical tasks, as important, if not more important, is talking, listening, and emotional nurturing. The distinctive temporal consciousness that characterises this kind of fluid, open-ended caring, one that goes beyond serving three meals a day, does not fit with the rigid clock time of machines. 
Caring tasks are also often fragmented and woven into other processes rather than being completed as discrete tasks. Giving and receiving care involves slowness, being there, forms of intimacy that can't be automated. The fact that people get overly attached to robots shouldn't blind us to the fact that this intense relationship can't be reciprocated. We're in danger of conflating caring as a behaviour with caring as a feeling. Machines can take care of us, but they do not care about us. And it's notable, I think, that the firm uh, behind Pepper felt obliged to warn customers against tampering with the robot's software to give it a sexier voice, and against using it, quotes, to perform any sexual act. We seem enthusiastic about giving robots emotions, but perhaps the last taboo is sex with robots. Just to the return to the film Ex Machina, we see that the isolated Silicon S scientist Bill ro builds robots partly for his sexual gratification. The appearance of the central female robot, his latest attempt at the Turing test, and yes, these films are all, you know, have always got the Turing test in there, the iconic, you know, is secretly based on the pornographic preferences of her tester, so he's more likely to fall in love with her. And so I can't help sometimes wondering about some of the prototypes that are being developed in Japan. Here's just one. Um, this is HRP4C, Humanoid Robotics Project for Cyborg, and it is built to the dimensions based on the average values for young, attractive Japanese females, presumably uh, to attract uh, male buyers. And I think, really, uh, the image speaks for itself. OK, so to bring these remarks to some sort of conclusion, I think the robots of tomorrow, like science fiction, tell us more about our conceptions of the present than they do about possible futures. Whereas automation in the industrial era was designed to replace heavy physical toil, the contemporary service economy throws up far greater challenges. Much of this work requires information processing, sophisticated communication skills, and emotional sensitivity to clients' needs. And all this has to be achieved at an accelerated pace as expectations of productivity, employing every minute wisely, have never been higher. And against this backdrop, robots are presented to us as miraculous, time-saving tools that will make our lives easier, faster, more efficient, and safe. They're romanticised as personal assistants who are tailored to fulfil our desires and fantasies. If we can't all live the idealised life of a Google employee, whose every need is reputedly taken care of within the grounds of their campus, then we can at least dream of a robot who will cook, clean, encourage us to exercise, monitor our sleep and mood patterns, and even know how we feel before we do. That's the new promise. Intoxicated by this ideal, more and more activities that were once outside the market are now being given a monetary value and pitched for a technical solution. And I think in this context, it's very hard to step back and reflect on what sort of robotics we want and what purposes it might serve. And this is particularly so because the powerful cyber gurus of Silicon Valley define the future in predominantly technological terms. To my mind, these futuristic visions, whether it's sociable robots or the Internet of Things, are actually incredibly conservative. And they don't even begin to think imaginatively about alternative social relationships and ways of living. It's a vision of the world in which everything changes, so long as everything stays exactly the same. Automation shouldn't be venerated as an end in itself, nor taken as a measure of progress. In doing so, we risk forgetting the value of our social relationships. Not all labour can be automated, but nor should we want it to be. The question should not just be, how do we save time with robots, but what do we want to save time for? And that perhaps the people who are designing our robots and making these decisions aren't in the best position to do so. Now, I know this is a sitcom, but actually, it's very accurate. 
among the engineers of the most powerful companies in the world today, like Microsoft, Apple and Google, there are very few women, few minor people, minorities, and few people over 40. And I hope I've, I've been arguing this for decades now, but I hope I've convinced you this evening that this does inevitably influence the kinds of technologies we get. And if you don't believe me, then you'll surely believe the new superhero of artificial intelligence, Demis uh, Hassabus of DeepMind, who we now, you know, this is the truth now, who recently stated that technology is a learning system, but to quote, so inevitably it will bear some imprint of the value system and culture of the designer. So perhaps it's far um, past the time where we need a female Doctor Who to provoke a feminist reimagining of robotics, one that challenges the future on offer from the evangelists of Silicon Valley. My last slide is a joke that amuses me, that something as prosaic as a staircase can stop an exterminating Dalek in its tracks. And I know someone here is going to say to me, oh, but they can climb stairs now, Jude. Haven't you seen the latest DARPA? I have. Um, but my point here is that stairs and steps remain mundane exclusionary barriers to women with pushchairs and prams and to people in wheelchairs. So I think it's an apt image for debunking some of the hype about the transformative potential of technology and a good note on which to end this talk. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Judy, for that uh, much-needed uh, widening of our perspective and corrective on uh, a lot of the things that we've actually been doing and thinking about in the Oxford Martin School. We do a lot of work on uh, machine automation, on the workplace, on robotics, uh, and many of these dimensions, and I think we're guilty of some of the sins that uh, you've highlighted, uh, but it's, it's very important, at least on this day that we think about these things deeply in the way you have and the interaction with society. Um, and every day, this and, day and, and every day. And, the, and every day, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I'm sure many of you have questions and comments, but I do want to uh, first uh, ask um, uh, two leaders of our group working on machine automation in the workplace uh, what they make of this and whether they have any comments. So Michael really? Osborne and oh Carl, God, Fre Carl Freo here, so oh I'm going to put them, on, put the them on the spot. Gosh, <laughs> gosh. And you can ask a question rather than give me a comment if you want to. Sure. Um, <laughs> I'd love a comment as well, yes. <laughs> well, I, no, I found it a fascinating talk and thank you very much. So, um, you know, part of our own work is to flag up the bottlenecks to automation mm -hmm. and key amongst them is this idea that creativity and social intelligence are some of the most difficult things to automate, and that seems to map on quite well to traditional gender roles. Mm. So I wondered if an alternative explanation for why um, roboticists and uh, programmers tend to favour female appearances for their devices is as a form of boasting, in that uh, if those social skills are seen as being uh, associated with you know, female behaviours, and those are very difficult things to you know, automate, to create, maybe creating a female robot or you know, depicting your robot as being female as a way of, uh, you know, projecting it as being more capable, more advanced than it actually is. So that's not really a question. <laughs> I mean, it's very interesting because, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting observation because when I look at these um, sociable robots, the set of emotions, you know, they have such a limited set of emotions and that you have that thing and they always tell you with these projects and you know this better than me, that, you know, the, the, the robot can express, you know, anger, this, that, you know, that there's these sort of set of things and you do wonder what this repertoire is and whether... Um, how could I not put it crudely? Just whether there were more people involved in this work who, who do the work of caring might, might have a rather broader, more sophisticated set of emotions that one might be sort of discussing. It seems sort of rather limited in terms of, of, of what human is, is seen like. I mean, I went, just let me give you an example. I went to a paper, um, this is your paper, someone else's paper on robotics, and, you know, the guy... Um, literally um, put up a sheet and said, you know, this is what it is to be human and this is what our machine can do. And I just thought, well, actually, it was a very limited notion of what it is to be human. It wasn't at all a kind of, you know, and I do sort of worry about that because it is all of these discussions really 
assume a particular definition of, you know, what is it to be human and then what are we trying to mimic? And, you know, perhaps we need to go back and have a discussion really about what a full human being is in order to even begin this conversation. Um, Carl? Carl's the other half of the leadership of our, of our robotics and work group. <laughs> I was wondering, actually, if I mean, if one looks at how technology has been changing the uh, structure of the workforce in the past, I think you were alluding mm. to technology displacing for sort of physical work, uh, manufacturing jobs, uh, quite male-dominated occupations in general, uh, and also uh, the adoption of household uh, uh, appliances, so dishwashers and washing machines. So some studies show that that's associated with the increase of women in the uh, labor force. Uh, and when we look sort of forward, uh, what we find is that actually men in general are more susceptible to automation uh, than women are. So could it on the one hand be that although, uh, um, as you, you uh, explained in your presentation, that male-dominated STEM occupations tend to develop these new technologies and that may lead to, 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 to uh, an increase in the gender gap if you like, also that automation is uh, contributing to actually closing the gender. Um, two things about that. Thank you for that question. I mean, I noticed in your report, and I hope you don't mind me saying so here, I mean, in the latest report on work called, what's it called? Web, uh, work 2, the, the Martin School report. Uh, you know, you do repeat that literature, the economics literature, that very much draws a causal connection between the introduction of domestic appliances and women going to work. And I would very much sort of counter that argument and have been doing for years because it, what it may, it, I think it's, a, and, and how you, um, you know, the book I was referring to makes a similar point and it seems to me that is a very technological determinist argument. I mean, you know, it leaves out the whole women's movement. I mean, I thought we had basically created the conditions actually for women massively going to work. I mean, clearly there were huge changes in the labour market in, and in op the occupational structure. Um, that, that made for the possibility of women going to work, but it was actually a political movement, um, changes in legislation, all sorts of things that we should stress today that encouraged women um, to go into the workforce. And somehow you read these economic studies and it's like, oh, you get a washing machine, so women go to work. Um, actually, I will say this as we're onto washing machines. I could give a whole lecture on washing machines. A few, thing, few things I'd like to say about washing machines, though, just in terms of the argument, <laughs> about technology, seriously, what you find is that people wash their clothes much more, right? That I always use the washing machine as an example of how a machine doesn't just substitute for labour, that, that there's this much laundry and then you introduce the machine and women go to work. Actually, people start buying all these different kinds of clothes. They start doing dark washers and light washers. You know, you find people doing an incredible lot of laundry. So technology actually transforms things always, changes standards, how we think about things. While we're on to the laundry, I will also <laughs> say, um, as I know quite a lot about time use statistics, that it is the case that women still do two-thirds of domestic work, and we know this. Men do a huge amount more than in the 50s, absolutely. Women do much less than they did in the 50s, uh, but there's still an imbalance. And you know, the one thing that is the hardest to get men to do is the laundry. It's amazing, all the things about, you know, the, um, the less segregation about domestic work, something about the washing machine and the laundry seems to really um, sort of stick there. Now, the broader um, question about the labour force is a huge question that we, you know, I'd love to have a proper debate with you about um, sometime. I mean, when one reads these reports, I mean, I've got a lot of problems with these reports, and actually I think the issue is much more a polarisation of the labour market than I think it is actually job loss, but that's, that's a sort of um, long issue, and I think there will still be a lot of service work, and it's poorly paid service work, and that's the problem with it, and some of that is feminised and migrant and um, all of those things. But, I mean, I am very concerned about the fact that... Um, to the extent one believes these future predictions, and I'm a great sceptic of these, uh, this sort of futurism, that it's high-skilled, high-tech jobs where there does seem to be growth. And, um, you know, I've, as I've always said, it's important for two reasons. I think it's incredibly important because if that's going to be where well-paid, decent jobs are, why shouldn't women have half of them? So it's just an equity sort of issue. But the other issue is if the people who design things are so unrepresentative of us, you know, how are, how are guys actually going to have the 
you know, you design things from your lived experience. Of course you do. That affects how you design things. So it seems to me it's important to have a lot more diverse groups, including women, it, at the design process to rebuild the world. I mean, these people are making, shaping the world in which we live. So I think it's a very important space in which to intervene. Anyway, I could go on this, but I'll just, yes. Okay, I'm great. I'm just starting on um, this, you know. This is, this is being... Um webcast live and recorded. So if you don't want to be webcast live and recorded, I suggest you don't say anything. Um, let's um, take the woman over there first. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, uh, yes. Hi. Hi, Judy. I'm Linda Grattan. I'm a professor at the London Business School. Um, Judy, actually, Ian and I were both at Davos yeah. this year, and Davos was absolutely full of people talking about robotics and technology, as indeed are most of the magazines now. Voices yeah. like yours are absolutely not being heard and they're not being communicated. And I've known you for some years now. And the question I want to ask you is, why hasn't sociology, particularly the work on time, why hasn't that been more impactful? Why haven't people listened to what you've said and what others have said? What, 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 have, what have you done wrong not to, have, not to be part of that debate. I, I just find it astounding, actually, because when I listen to you today, it just reminds me of how important this work is that you're doing. And it's just not, it's not in the public discourse. Well, it's very kind of you. I mean, there's lots of economists here who could probably answer this question um, better than me. I think, I think the debate, I, I mean, I was uh, talking um, to Ian about this um, this evening. It seems to me that the debate about work and robotics and employment is absolutely dominated by economists. And, econ and there's absolutely not enough engagement between economists and sociologists of work and employment. I mean, you know, those of us like me have actually been working, and you, at, in workplaces, looking at how people use technology on the ground, you know, doing that sort of, and there's just a huge gap that, of, a, of a discussion between, you know, the grand economic predictions and things and actually, well, let's actually go into some workplaces and have a look what's going on and have a conversation about that. And I think you'd get a very different picture if you did that. But it's a much more complicated picture. I think partly, um, you know, we're more reticent to be in this game of futurism. I mean, I have to say that I'm, if I can just say this, you know, I mean, at the moment, you know, practically every week now, I'm literally getting a book um, from a publisher to review, a manuscript, you know, to review um, from publishers from different publishers, and they've all got the same title. They're literally called Robots Are Taking Your Job or The Digitalization of Relay Life. You know, I just write back and say, I've read this book a million times. You know, <laughs> and they're all just speculations. I mean, none of them are like a serious, you know, serious, <laughs> serious social science book. They're just speculative chats. Um, I won't mention, I could mention many of these books, but I won't about what they you know, think about the future and blah, and what their anecdotal experience is. And it just seems to have captured um, the space. But more seriously, if I can just add to that, and, and I do mean this very seriously, I, the, um, the public space of critical journalism, I think, has really shrunk. And I'm very struck over my 30 years, that 30 years ago, when a new computer came out, like Coca-Cola, they had to take an ad out in the newspaper and advertise this, right? We didn't live in a world where Apple products are actually news, where every move these guys make, the deep mind guy, the, you know, Steve Jobs, where every move they make is like the news, it is completely in the news, that the journalists from everywhere are flown out to have a little drive in a self-driving car, and then they do a double page spread, sorry, I'll finish in a moment, double page spread, and wasn't it fantastic? They're basically performing the work of these companies, they're performing, actually, the sort of enactment of dreams that these products will fulfill. And they're doing all that work for the companies. And I think the space of a critical account of these things has really shrunk, actually. And so I was very, you know, when the independent news came through, I just thought, oh, no, another, you know, narrowing, actually, of the journalistic sort of space. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. I feel good. passionately all right, about that. David and then uh, Sinatra. <laughs> You talked about uh, caring, caring for and doing the act of caring. Yep. I wanted to ask you about something which I think is harder, which is trusting. Yep. Um, the Google car crash two or three days ago turns out to have been because the Google car thought that 
it was conventional practice that the car in the lane it was moving into would normally give way in these circumstances. And it trusted that driver. And we, and we go to the doctor and we've got a difficult form of cancer and we trust that doctor to decide whether he should save the NHS some money and let us die or put us forward as someone who should be treated. And quite soon, uh, Google cars will be acting as doctors or whatever, that gets a bit mixed up, but, uh, and, and will be making decisions about tr things that we want to be able to trust the other part of the engagement. I wonder what you think about that. I mean, that's very interesting. And I, actually reading your report, I, I found and I didn't sort of realise that there's already a bit of a discussion amongst roboticists about ethics. I found that there's, yeah. Um, and I think it was a piece by Noel Sharkey that you mentioned about, you know, uh, the ethics of caring robots and things like that. I mean, I mean, one of my uh, problems is that, you know, ethics comes after things exist, yeah? It was like we had an ethics um, committee about in vitro fertilisation, right? That things are developed and then you have an ethics committee and you decide about some legislation and some moral discussions about them, yeah? What we've been trying to do in science and technology studies now for 30 years is say, actually, let's have the discussion at the point of research and development. You know, before we design drones, let's have a discussion about whether we want public money designing drones, not have to have what is now a huge campaign about the use of drones in warfare, which is, you know, which then is an ethical, moral, human rights sort of discussion. So I'm always trying to argue that we need to sort of step back and actually think about the fact that there's lots of technologies that aren't developed. At every point with technologies, there are what we call paths not taken. There's heaps of options, you know, look at the Google Glass, you know, he, you know, that already got so that we know about it, but there's loads of technologies. As we know, alternatives to the car were invented, what, 30, 40 years ago. Um, electric cars were in how long ago? Electric cars were, the, but you know. 100 they, years ago. 100, thank you, 100 years ago, but they weren't developed. Mm -hmm. So I've always tried to sort of push it back to say, let's actually have a politics, not an ethics, mm -hmm. but a politics about research and development and an informed public debate about it, you know. And I mean, I, I think it's interesting that the Royal Society, when they've done surveys of citizens, find that there's an incredible thirst in the public for engaging about science and technology. Now, people really want to know about what's being developed, what the future is going to look like, and want to participate in that. And so people need to be sort of educated to do that. Trust, you want me to get back to the trust? What can I say about trust? I mean, trust is an interpersonal, um, huh? I mean, I mean, it's a different thing than risk, right? With machines, you do risk assessment. It's a, that, I think that's a very different conception than sort of trust, actually, which is built up over time, you know, as an interpersonal relationship. I'm still all for the face-to-face -face relationship, David. As you know, we have regular lunches and love it. Sinatra. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Okay, um, I'm going to go back to your washing machine. Yes. Because I like the washing machine. Um, the question I really want to ask yes. is about um, new models for distribution. Of about, sorry? Models for distribution of income. Because yes. I think that's one of the pertinent yes. questions. And I use the washing machine there also to try and make my point, which is um, that, okay, so you get your washing machine and it's better for everybody but then how are you going to pay your cleaning lady? Now, what you really want is your cleaning lady to sit there and read Proust instead of washing clothes. But if you follow this sort of rigid notion that I have come across among economists that actually having automation is going to create huge disparity of income, um, then you'd, I mean, the equivalent would be to say, no, I'm not gonna get the washing machine because otherwise how would I pay my cleaning lady? So what do you think is the solution? Do you think notions such as basic income can, can actually um, provide a di Are we going to have to radically rethink our models for distribution of wealth? And how, do, how is that going to affect women? I mean, that's a great question. I'm pleased that we seem again, and I say again because I remember the basic income discussions, as I'm sure you do, for, 
68 and 70. I'm very pleased that we're having that discussion again, but I don't like the way Silicon Valley have decided that they're going to be the ones that start talking about basic income and, you know, we could go there. Um, I'm, I'm much more um, am enthusiastic to go in the direction of a redistribution of working hours. It does seem to me that all of the data we have says that there's an incredible polarisation of hours, yeah? that there are people, professionals and managers, working incredibly long hours and lots of people working much fewer hours than they would like to work. And so one wouldn't need, if one was working fewer hours, one might not need a cleaning lady. I, knew, I can't go with a particular example. But I think the redistribution of hours is a much better conversation. And I'm very struck by the fact that, you know, if I can just re refer to the debate at Davos again about employment, that of course um, these people who work all hours uh, Talk, are much more willing to talk about a basic income than actually talk about restructuring work. And one of the things that, you know, feminists have talked about for years, and I wrote a book on women in management, you know, years ago, I don't know, 20 years ago or something, um, where we were trying to talk about how the structure of careers, what you needed to have a successful career, assumed, uh, had a male model, that someone else was going to look after your kids and help you move and do all of these things, and that what we needed to do was change the nature of work, the nature of careers, so that people could do more sharing of domestic work, of caring, of all these sort of things. And I'd much rather have a discussion about redistribution of working hours, actually, that I'm, I'm suspicious about the basic income. I don't mind a basic income conversation from the left, from socialists, but I don't like being told by Silicon Valley that, oh, we're going to get rid of all the jobs, so there'll be a basic income. By the way, we'll do away with the state. You know, we don't need a welfare state. We'll just have a, you know, I'm very suspicious of that kind of conversation. And actually, there was a beautiful editorial in the weekend by Morozov, you know, Eugenie Morozov, um, critiquing this, you know, where this new notion was coming from. I mean, it actually reminded me of old discussions of Marcuse. Do you remember Marcuse from, you know, 68, where Marcuse used to uh, talk about how capitalism has this amazing ability to sort of suck up any radical sort of ideas. And when I heard them at Davos talking about the basic income, I just thought, no, please, you know, <laughs> not, not that too. <laughs> yep. Um, all right. Uh, Roz, the woman over there, and then we'll move to the side of the, the room, I promise. <laughs> well, I was just thinking that I think you're going to have a really difficult job in getting um, people to think about a redistribution of working hours and how we, we allocate that, because that picture of the protein shake or whatever that guy was drinking, you know, is part, busyness, yeah. I think, is actually part of the Silicon Valley conceit. Yeah. And actually, it's even almost as important as wealth, that people define their importance by how busy they are. So you won't get someone admitting that they're not busy. Yeah. And so, you know, that is very important. And, and busyness and being time poor is very much something that successful professional people have. And uh, poorer people, less, you know, they're the ones who are uh, sort of uh, money poor and time rich but actually that, there's not much richness in their time. I mean, I'm glad you've raised that, and I completely agree Just with... Stick it. with the mic. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I'm glad you've raised that. I completely agree with you, and I do think that one of our problems is that busyness is now associated with being uh, rich and important and associated with high status. And again, um, I don't want to sort of go on about Silicon Valley, but it seems to me that the images that one always gets of these entrepreneurs... They always report that they work 24-7, that they're working all the time, answering emails all the time, and that this is taken as a sign of genius, you know. And there's this fantastic book, actually, by an anthropologist at um, New York University called Emily Martin um, about, um, uh, what do you call it, bipolar, about bipolar depression, where she sort of talks about how, the, how being manic now, you know, it's sort of psychological cultural critique, but sort of says that these images of people like Steve Jobs as sort of, that the manicness is now taken as the height of creativity and genius, you know, that we've sort of so shifted in our notion of what we think it is to be sort of smart. And so I think you're absolutely right, it's, it's a tough thing to do, but I think we've really got to, I mean, that's why I'm really annoyed whenever I read these colour supplements. I just think, well, actually, you know, who's doing all the infrastructure work 
to, to enable this person to live like this. Actually, there's a lot of labour, and whether it's a wife or whether it's, you know, task rabbit or the cleaners or the taxi drivers that are sitting around waiting so the person can move quickly, it's all based on inequality. It's all based on other people's labour being less valuable than their labour. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm very struck when you read about things like, you know, Task Rabbit or, you know, these apps, all of these apps. I mean, the apps are just ways of distribute, distributing low-paid labour. You know, what, what's app about the apps, you know, in terms of labour relations, you know? All right, over there, and then we must move to the side of the room. <laughs> um, my name's Rose. Uh, an observation and a question. Uh, in India, um, and the uh, the growth of the information technology and the BPO particularly has uh, enabled a whole subsection of women yep. to get status and um, independence in a way which they could never have believed in one generation could happen. How do you see automation um, and technology uh, impacting emerging economies? It's, it's not a field of my expertise, but I find that very interesting. And I thought about doing a project on, on Indian programmers in California, actually, because I'm, I wonder how different, it is, how, how, dif how different it is for the Indian programmers in California and the Indian programmers in India. And um, I did meet a, a PhD student who was doing work with the wives in California, and it seems like for some reason in California the men work and the wives don't. So there's sort of different sets of relationships in the different places. But I, I honestly don't know enough about that to say. There's something in the new um, GPS that that Khan and Michael have contributed that, that does talk a little bit about, but not the gender dimensions. Mm. Okay, let's see the hands on the side of yep. the um, only may your hands. All right, we'll mm -hmm. <laughs> start in the front. Thank you. Yeah, Judy, um, I wanted to go back to the washing machines as well, um, <laughs> I guess, and give you an opportunity here to talk about something that seemed to me to be an implication of your talk. Um, you talked about uh, Silicon Valley defining the future and that what we really needed was a feminist reimagination of the future. So could you just speculate briefly on what a feminist reimagination of the future would look like and how that would be different than the future uh, that's projected by people working on robotics today? Well, am I, that's a very hard question, and I have to say that when I was asked that about socialism 30 years ago, I couldn't answer it either. Um, but, you know, it does seem to me that a crucial difference would be in terms of what labour is valued and that one might re redo the occupational categories so that babysitting and looking after children and caring were rated as the most highly skilled things and some of the current skills that are rated very highly would be rated uh, lower down, that the pay scales for various skills would be transformed. And one of the early, thing, early uh, projects feminist economists were actually engaged in was precisely trying to re-describe what a skill is, to, to talk about the fact that a lot of the work that women do is highly skilled but isn't paid as highly skilled, and to talk about the enormous contribution to the economy that unpaid work makes. You know, so it was part of redefining how we measure the economy, actually. And this has been very important in terms of the third world and the developing world, that there's a lot of work outside the market that isn't uh, given the same amount of uh, value as, as market work. So it's partly sort of broadening those things out. I mean, it's very hard to say in the abstract. I mean, I was at this, um, I was in Barcelona. This is a silly thing, but you know, I just happened to have a slide here. I was in Barcelona last week um, at the Contemporary uh, Cultural Centre and Museum, and they had an exhibition on, on various cyborg-y things, as they do now in all these. Uh, cultural places that I sort of go to and they're very interested in time and temporality. And an artist, um, this was one of the installations, and I really loved it actually. It's A, B and B, you know, that, that make huge amounts of things. And I just thought, well, actually, here is a very functional, fantastic thing, but nobody has bothered to make this A, B and B machine look like a cutesy-pootsy person with, you know, it's just a very sort of functional thing that would be sort of fantastic. And I just think one might go one might think about, I suppose, you know, to put it sort of as its crudest, 
one might think about social problems first and technological solutions later, rather than, and we know this, with the big push to the internet of things and big data, that you know, it is like all this stuff is looking for problems, it's looking for something to do, rather than starting with some social problems and then thinking, okay, how are we gonna solve these? So it would be, if a, if a feminist contribution would be, I'd be happy with that actually, if we could just do that, that would be good. Yeah, I'd be happy with it. <laughs> I could rock babies to sleep at night. Um, <laughs> there was a book many years ago called Design for the Real World. Ah. So I want to say something about the real world and ask a question about design. I don't know that book, actually. Uh, Victor Papanik. Uh -huh. It was an industrial designer who actually showed how you could explicitly design to help the poor which was the first book I read when starting my PhD in appropriate technology in the science studies unit at Edinburgh University. Now, uh, a lot of the things you talk, the, talked about are not the real world. The people under intense time pressure are those in startup companies and those forced to work on the assembly lines and BMW here, but that isn't actually what most of the people were. The women in Kenya, cook, cleaning the clothes on stone all the time, the farmers in Bangladesh just occasionally appropriating mobile phones to find a better fertilizer price. That's not the real world. And of course, the ideal carers who love people and don't leave them to lie in their urine for days and bully them and so on, and maybe worse than the robots. Yeah. Or the 15-minute visits here. Again, you know, that's the difference to the real world. So, on Saturday, I went to a talk about the 40th anniversary of the Lucas Aerospace Shop Stewards Combine, yeah. where workers in Lucas explicitly set out to design technologies that weren't military, but would use their skills. And this, um, so I'm, the question is about the possibility of explicitly designing for people as opposed to taking just what's designed in um, some parts of Silicon Valley. And what do you think is a possibility of that? Should we actually all be, instead of studying sociology, going down to the hack space by the Oxford Castle and start building things to uh, help people with floods or whatever? I mean, I'm, I'm very, I, I mean, you go back, Lucas Aerospace is dear to my heart, as you can imagine. I'm very glad you've raised the issue of the military. I mean, I have to say that when I think about um, technology, you know, the military and pornography are pretty close, uh, closely associated uh, in reality, in history, and in every way. And a lot of the technology we get, and this is one of the things we wrote about in 1985, um, is, is military technology that then finds a commercial purpose that wasn't originally designed for a commercial purpose but then finds a, um, an adaption. And a lot of the technology we're getting now is military. And, and what, um, I mean, again, really strikes me is that in 1985, we thought this was quite an original thing to expose how deeply our technology was formed by the military. Now it seems like it's not even a problem. I mean, at this... Um, meeting I was at in Washington, people talked about working in DARPA some of the time, working in, you know, other companies, as if this wasn't an issue, you know, that the, that it's just become acceptable now somehow that there are these incredibly close links between the military and these commercial companies. And, um, and actually at this same conference, some of us were sort of raising this issue and there was a political um, lobbyist there, quite a high up guy, and he said that they had tried actually to get some research and development money out of the military budget into a more social budget and that they just couldn't get it through Congress. So it seems to me this, you know, this is at the level of sort of state politics actually that one really needs to be at, at that point intervening in, you know, where is research and development money going? Who's getting first dibs at it? And, and you know, why is so much of it going to the military? Yeah, hundreds of times more than, uh, mm -hmm. Hundred times more than, for example, on energy. Yeah, um, than energy. For climate change, no, yeah. but I mean, yeah. I was actually going to make that point. Absolutely, I, I'm I'm totally sympathetic with that. I mean, if we put the money into looking for alternative energy that we put into military, we'd have solved the problem. You know, yeah. no. Some Daniel Scharf. 
Professor Jill Manthorpe was in Oxford on Monday. You might know her. She's at King's, and she's Professor of Care. And her of what, sorry? Care. Ah. It's a longer title than that, but ah. she's talking about care. Right. And her great lament was that the incontinence pad hasn't been redesigned in, well, ever. Yes. 30, 40 years. And I'm looking at your robots, and I wonder if any of those are programmed to change incontinence pads. Um, because one of the things about neighbourliness is I'm very happy to be very neighbourly until I turn, it turns out my neighbour is incontinent. And they don't want me, they want a woman, because they're the people who change all the pads. Mm -hmm. um, and if that was done automatically, then I think we could be much more neighbourly. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great example, and there's lots of examples like that, and I've been reading about them recently, and I sort of completely agree. And I mean, the one I use in teaching is why we have a female pill and not a male pill. You know, what's that about? And there's great books about that in terms of that that's, uh, that's political and cultural and not physiological, you know, so yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, uh, behind that, over there, and then I think we'll more or less compliment. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you a rest. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, I really enjoyed the talk. There's kind of two, two things that you said that I really kind of felt really, um, really um, got my mind going. One was about how we need to think about uh, these discussions around automation and robots in terms of what they really say about the times we're living in now, and they're not so much about the future, but about the experiences we're having now. Um, and also that kind of journalists and maybe also academics are doing the job of corporations themselves in advertising these, um, these robots. And kind of, yeah, it almost makes me, even though I don't know anything about ro robots, it makes me want to quit my job and set up a a robotics firm, because I'm sure I could find a lot of venture capitalism uh, looking for somewhere to invest. And so I guess my question is, how much do we need to take a more abstract view and actually think about capitalism and what's happening in capitalism and that we're coming out of this decade-long economic crisis, commodity prices are low, China's slowing down. How much is it actually that, that, that kind of corporations, individuals trying to find ways to absorb all this capital which doesn't have other ways to find profits and how maybe we need to go back and think more about capitalism uh, itself as kind of fueling these, these processes. Small question. <laughs> I, I mean, I, com I completely agree with you that, um, you know, the way... You, you know, that investment is, is incredibly skewed and it seems very odd, the things that are invested in and the things that aren't invested in. No, I mean, I agree. I, it's too big a question for me to answer here, Alex. <laughs> um, unless anyone else has got a pressing question, yeah. I think you have the final question. Yeah. Thank you very much. And just following on from this question, yes. perhaps maybe a small element yes. might be that, considering the kind of capitalist military-industrial complex, whilst we're becoming busier and busier, and yet we're not getting more free time, could that perhaps be that capitalism as we have it and consumerism is growth-based? And do we need to ask a question of whether we can sustain growth on this planet and as humans? And I was wondering if your work, especially in technology, has come across this, um, or yeah, or your, what your own, or what you've come across? Um, I don't sort of directly engage with that, but I, I'm, and I'm not a sociologist of consumption, but there's very interesting work being written about consumption and the role of expectations and the role of all, all of this advertising. And, you know, in, in sociology, we, we sort of talk about um, this sort of advertising is actually sort of performative, that they're sort of performing a future. This is all about envisaging a future. And I mean, I was reading this German social theorist yesterday, and he was sort of talking about the fact that somehow when you're queuing for the new Apple product, it's, it's sort of like the promise of the product that you haven't yet bought is worth more, actually, than the products you've got. And that, in fact, when you finally get the product, you'll be disappointed. So it's important that you just haven't got the latest iteration and that there will be more and more iterations to come. So it does seem, it, you know, that we're being sort of fed a whole lot of desires and fantasies that we think will be answered by machines, you know, and... And, you know, to, to make a sort of grander point, perhaps, I mean, I think if we're discussing, I mean, it's the anniversary of Utopia, you know, Moore's Utopia this year, and I mean, you know, utopias should be about alternative ways of living, alternative kinds of politics, not about alternative, um, you know, gadgets and technologies, I think, and somehow this is occupying far too much space in our discussions about alternative futures. 
Great. Judy, thank you very, very much. I think we've had an incredibly stimulating, not only lecture, but discussion following it, uh, which will certainly, I think, resonate with many of the things we think about, and we think about these issues uh, all the time. You've been a perfect choice uh, for our International Women's Day speaker, so thank you uh, for being here. Before we um, thank Judy, as it so happens, uh, the three events I want to announce are all pretty techno. Uh, um, and. Um, don't include some of the dimensions of you, so you're very healthy uh, corrective. Uh, tomorrow at 5 o'clock here uh, in our series on, um, of seminars, we have Dr. Ingmar Posner speaking on driverless vehicles navigating an autonomous future. Um, so take from today, come tomorrow, and uh, if she uh, is surprised by some of the questions, you, you know, you, you, those that have been here tonight won't be. Um, on the following Thursday, that's the 10th of March in the same seminar series at 5 o'clock, we have Professor Doan Farmer on predicting technological progress. Much bigger picture, and he goes back uh, in history as well as forward, trying to understand how we can predict a technological change. Also very germane to this evening's discussion. And then um, if you want to uh, see how Google thinks, we have the principal scientist at Google, Blaise Iguera Iacas, on Tuesday the 10th of May at 5 o'clock on Inside the Machine's Mind, latest insights on neuroscience and computer science, the intersection of neuroscience and computer science. And he's uh, really a fantastic guy to engage with who's very, very thoughtful on both these dimensions. So plenty more uh, to engage in on these topics, uh, but tonight we really do owe you a huge debt of thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.